We're about to begin solutions of Schrodinger's equation for systems in three dimensions. I think the first clear application for three-dimensional solutions is the atom, starting, of course, with the hydrogen atom. Imagine a proton at the origin, and I'll put an XYZ coordinate system, and the electron is somewhere orbiting about the proton out in space. Let's connect the proton and the electron with a vector, which we'll label R. And if I want to locate this electron using spherical coordinates with the proton at the origin, or not, I can be shifted, I need to sketch out the spherical coordinates. In the Cartesian system, the z-coordinate of the electron is found by casting a shadow of the R vector onto the z-axis, and that R vector makes an angle theta with the z-axis. It's a little more complicated to locate the electron relative to the x and the y axes. First, imagine a light directly above the r vector casting a shadow of the r vector onto the xy plane. And that shadow makes an angle phi relative to the x axis. The z coordinate of the electron can be written in terms of the r and the theta as r cos theta. And this shadow in the xy plane is r sine of theta. And so the x coordinate and the y coordinates can be located with an additional trig argument. I'll write them over here. So we have z is r cos theta. We have x is r sine theta cosine of phi. And we have y is r sine theta sine phi. In the case of the hydrogen atom, spherical coordinates is perfect because not only is it a central force where you have one source of the force on the electron being the proton, but you also have spherical symmetry. The potential energy of the electron depends only on r, the distance from the proton. And that's the potential energy that will go into the Schrodinger equation. I'll write out the Schrodinger equation in three dimensions. First, by just writing the Schrodinger equation, the time-dependent version is I h bar d psi by dt equals minus h bar squared over 2m times the Laplacian of the wave function plus the potential energy times the wave function. And it's very important to keep in mind that this potential energy function, V of r, depends only on R. The time derivative can be very easily simplified down for stationary states. Remember that the time dependence of a Schrodinger wave function was justified in the first two pages of chapter 2 of Griffiths, which I recommend you from time to time just go back and look at it again. That's the description of a stationary state. Now let's do the derivative. So we have the wave function recovered again, psi 0 e to the minus i e over h bar t. This exponential is the unitary time development operator on the wave function. And that gives us the time independent Schrodinger equation. The Laplacian is a three dimensional operator with r, theta, and phi, if, if we can solve this linear differential equation with separation of variables, then by the uniqueness theorem, that will be the solution. So we have to try that first. We just, we really have to. The reason why we have to is because it is the simplest approach to solving any partial differential equation. We'll separate out three functions. The wave function, which depends on r, theta, and phi, will be a function of r, which I'll call capital R of r, a function of theta, which we'll call capital theta of theta, and a function of phi, which function is called capital phi, a function of the coordinate phi. Capital letters are the functions, the lowercase letters are the variables. Put this into the Schrodinger equation. Using the Laplacian in three dimensions, we can have a messy but solvable solution. So let me write this out using that Laplacian operator in three dimensions.
and then putting in the separated wave function. So you'll see I pulled the functions theta and phi out of the derivative since the R derivative doesn't operate on them. Before I go any farther, I will take this term, which has potential energy in it, it has all R's in it, and bring it over here, write it next. Then I'll write the terms that have theta and phi in them. Again, pulling out the R and phi part because they're not operated on by the theta differential. To separate these, divide through by the whole wave function, capital phi times capital theta times capital R, because in each one of these terms, two of those three will cancel. And when you do that, you will have the first two terms forming an equation that has only R in it, because the capital theta and capital phi cancel out. And then the next two terms, We'll make an equation that has only theta and phi in it, but not r, because the big R cancels out. The first term gives you this 1 over r, or big R. I divide through by theta, phi, and big R. The theta and the phi functions cancel, and I'm left with this r. I'll write it here like this, and see if you can see where the little r squared went. So that's what the first two terms look like. The next two terms have to add up, apparently, to the constant. The point is when you have two functions, one a function of r and one a function of theta and phi, both adding up to a constant, they have to be equal to the same constant. So I'm going to go ahead and just write equals some constant c. Now the theta term and the phi term need to add up to a constant, which means the term that has only theta in it and the term that only has phi in it will need to add up to the same constant. And so we'll get these two expressions. And notice how I've dispensed with the partial derivatives now, because I'm going to have three equations, one for each variable. There's no more partial differentiation needed. And we'll call the constant b. The theta term and the phi term both need to be equal to this constant b. For the phi term, we're simply going to have the second derivative of phi equals phi, which is a simple enough equation to solve. So you know constants always result from separation of variables. As you separate the equation into terms, with only one of the variables in each term. What you end up with in separation of variables is several constants. The number of constants equals the number of variables minus one. We have three variables, r, theta, phi, and we have two constants, c and b. These two constants, c and b, are usually renamed for purposes of avoiding messes. c is usually renamed L times L plus 1, where L is a constant. I can't give you a really good reason right now for why you would want to rewrite the constant C as a constant L times a constant L plus 1. Perfectly valid mathematically, driven by hindsight, it will make for a less messy solution. And B is a constant squared. All constants are some constant squared, and we're going to call that constant m sub l. It simply leads to a less messy solution to do this. Can you solve these equations if you don't make these changes? Well, yes, they'll just be messier. Now, in lecture, we're going to go through the solutions to each of these three equations. We had the r equation, and we had the theta phi equation. We're going to talk about those solutions, and we're going to talk about the results of those solutions. 
I'll summarize the solutions for each one of them very briefly. The phi equation is the easiest, so I'll talk about that first. It's the second order differential equation. You already know what that solution is going to look like, so you can just say what it is. It's e to the i m phi. I have adopted this subscript L on the M, which you'll notice is absent in the textbook matter of personal preference. I'm going to have it in there because when we start dealing with the hydrogen atom, we're going to call it M sub L, the magnetic quantum number. It needs to be an integer, which hopefully is fairly evident to you because if M sub L is not an integer, then the function phi, capital phi, does not return to its own value when the variable, little phi, goes about 2 pi. The theta equation has a lot more detail to it. It's a classic differential equation which has these solutions which are called associated Legendre functions which are based on the Legendre polynomials. A few examples are listed here. And finally, the R equation. We can't go any farther with the R equation just yet because the result depends on the potential energy V of R. Different situations will have different expressions for it, and potential energy goes into the R equation. It didn't go into the theta and phi equation, so we didn't need any information about what it is to solve those. But we do need information about it to solve the R equation. We do go on the assumption that the potential energy is depending only on the radius, and using that assumption, Griffiths works out two examples in Chapter 4. In Section 4.1, he works out the spherical potential well where the potential energy equals zero for a radius less than a certain amount b, and it's otherwise infinite. And given that potential energy, the solutions are spherical Bessel functions, j sub l. This beta sub n l is the nth zero of the Bessel functions. The Bessel functions oscillate up and down to positive and negative values crossing zero an infinite number of times. The value of those zero crossings is what beta sub n l represents. So what we end up getting is an infinite number of solutions, r sub n l, and it's quantized where n serves as a principal quantum number. Section 4.2 of Griffiths works out the hydrogen atom where we have a Coulomb's law type of potential energy, uh, just a 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught e squared over r. And with that function as v of r, we end up getting solutions that are associated Laguerre polynomials. And at this stage, that's put in front of us as a postulated solution without derivation. And then a lot of descriptions given in section 4.2 of what the Laguerre polynomials look like and what the implications of them are, what those superscripts and subscripts mean. So that's what you need to pay attention to when you read section 4.2 is what is the structure of the Laguerre polynomials. With the theta, phi, and r solutions, we can put them all together and have a general solution to the Schrodinger equation in spherical coordinates where I'll write it as a normalization, which depends on the system, the R solution, and Y is just the product of the theta solution and the phi solution. So capital theta times capital phi is Y. It's called spherical harmonics. It's a solution to the Schrodinger equation on a sphere of given radius. Now we do have a principal quantum number, N, L is going to be the angular momentum quantum number, and M sub L will be the magnetic quantum number, which goes with that angular momentum. Read through section 4.1 of Griffiths in order to see these solutions worked out, and then section 4.2 applies the hydrogen atom conditions to resolve the further detail of this solution. But don't wait until Monday to see those solutions because I won't be putting textbook solutions to partial differential equations on the board since we do want to get through the textbook this semester. So I'm leaving it up to you to read section 4.1 of Griffiths before our next class meeting so that you're prepared for the discussion that we're going to have.